Well, good morning. It's Sunday, the 9th of January, and this is the uh, coronavirus update. And we've got a very serious paper to wade through today, but I just wanted to talk about a few things first. And I've been getting quite a few questions. Um, now, firstly, I want to apologise that some videos are being duplicated and some videos have been taken up and taken down. I'm just trying to sort of work out a way of getting these videos to as many people as possible that, that want to watch them. And, and lots of people have told me, helpfully, that uh, the names of your uh, videos are getting a bit silly. Uh, I know that. <laughs> but again, I, I want them to be able to uh, distribute as widely as possible without, um, w without censorship. Now, one of the problems with the current outbreak is that there's just social media everywhere. And there's good information on social media, some very good information. Uh, but there's some uh, misleading information as well, which is unfortunate. So it's a matter of uh, working out <laughs> which is which, really. I mean, I suppose if you want to follow me, you'll have to work out which mine is. Um, but I have said that mine uh, strives to be evidence-based and we do look at publications directly from the medical literature. So really what I'm trying to do in these podcasts is, is, is be a translator from the medical literature that I can read and normally work out roughly what it means after a while and, and, and just uh, sort of explain that and explain that to everyone. That's kind of what I'm trying to do. Uh, now, just before we go on to today's news, I want to talk about a, a few questions. So I've had a few questions. Now, <clears throat> one of my bad habits is <clears throat> using um, terminology without explaining it. So I do try and explain it, but sometimes I don't. So I had a question this morning. What is herd immunity? Because herd sounds like cows or sheep or something like that. So what, what, is, <clears throat> what is herd immunity? So <clears throat> what herd immunity is, it, it is immunity of the community that everyone has. So what happens is, for example, during a vaccination campaign, we'll vaccinate, say, 90% of the population, hopefully, against a particular disease with a, a very effective uh, vaccination. And what that will mean is that quite a lot of people are now immune to that disease. But there still may be odd cases <clears throat> of the disease crop up. So there can be odd diseases of the case crop up. But when one case of the disease pops up, then hopefully you're surrounded by people that are immune. So the people next door that way and the people next door that way are immune. So the person on the house a little bit further down has got this kind of buffer. I mean, literally, it wouldn't be houses, it would be people we come into contact with. So an infected person might come into contact with immune people. Those people that are immune won't get the disease, but they could come into contact with non-immune people. But the disease won't spread because there's enough people in the community who have immunity to stop the spread of the disease. <clears throat> and this is what we mean by herd immunity. So vaccines can generate herd immunity, or after there's been an outbreak, herd immunity can also be generated as well. Now, another question I get off, asked quite often is, is, where's the vaccine for this? Well, we haven't got a vaccine for this now, but lots of people are working on it. But it's difficult generating vaccines is not easy each one's got to be made individually and specifically because the virus is a specific antigen and the vaccine has to mimic that antigen to generate a specific immune response in the person giving the vaccine so it's difficult and even when a vaccine is designed and produced it still needs to be tested for safety to make sure it's safe and we also need to test it to make sure it generates an antibody response, that it's having an immunological benefit. And then we need to know if that immunological benefit is adequate to protect people from the disease. <clears throat> and then we need to manufacture it in large doses. So overall, this means that an effective vaccine is not going to come in the next few months. And realistically, I would say we're not going to have manufactured stocks ready for public distribution of this vaccine. Uh, it, it could well be up to a year be, before that happens. So um, we can't use a vaccine as our containment procedure yet. We have to use other methods. Now, people have asked me about antibodies. They say, well, when someone has the disease, they develop antibodies. <clears throat> and, and, that, and that's true. They become immune to it. We, we, we're certainly hoping that's the case by developing antibodies. So people have said, well, can't we take those antibodies and put them into someone who hasn't got the disease? Or can't we make those antibodies? Well, the antibodies uh, are immunoglobulins. They're big globular proteins. 
and they're very complicated, very specific molecules with very specific active sites <clears throat> that act against the antigen. So they're not easy to make. In fact, no human being can manufacture uh, immunoglobulins. It's utterly impossible. But the immunoglobulins in you, for example, if you're immune to a cold or last time you had influenza, you'll have made immunoglobulins to that. And you make the immunoglobulins to that virus with your lymphocytes. Your B lymphocytes manufacture large quantities <coughs> of this immunoglobulin, which is, which is great. Yeah, you become immune. And then what happens is your body produces memory cells, which are clones of the original cells. So if you get reinfected, the body can make lots of these new uh, antibodies straight away because it can generate clones of the most appropriate cell very quickly. Now, there is a technology called monoclonal antibodies where people isolate these uh, lymphocytes that produce the antibodies. <coughs> and they try and get them to produce an antibody which is all the same called a MAB, a monoclonal antibody. And these are useful and uh, they were of efficacious effect. They were useful in the Ebola uh, epidemic, which is also an RNA virus, of course. Now, I've never read that people are working on monoclonal antibodies for coronavirus, but I assume they are. But as, as a, an effective therapy at the moment, we don't have it because they are complicated proteins. Now, I've had lots of questions about race. Are particular races going to be more susceptible to this virus than others? Well, it, it's pretty well inconceivable that that is the case. I mean, all humans are, are remarkably closely related. We are all we are all one family. So Chinese, for example, are actually quite closely related to, to me, for example, for coming from, from uh, Western Europe. It might not look it, but genetically we are. And we share common ancestors not that long ago. So to me, uh, the idea that a virus would affect one race and not another is just unimaginable. I just can't see that at all. So I think we can... I'm happy dismissing that one. I can't see that they would have a racial... A racial preference for a, a, an infectious disease. Having said that, communities of people may have particular predispositions. So we know that one of the factors that can make this disease more severe is smoking. And uh, I don't know quite what the, the incidence of smoking in adults in my country is now. I think it's about 18%. It's gone down quite a lot. But in China, amongst men, it's quite high. I think more than half the men in China smoke. Quite appalling. But very less uh, percentage of the women in China smoke. Um, so does that make the men more prone to serious disease because they're Chinese men? No, but because they're smokers. But that would be true of any smoker. So, so there can be the way that communities live that can predispose them to viral infection, like if they live closely together or if there's a lot of kissing or things like that, but but the idea that a virus would affect races differently is... is um, uh, uh, no, I can reject that one. Um, now, lots of people uh, email me and uh, say, have I got the virus? I've got these various symptoms. And of course, we can't... Well, if I was there, I mean, doctors there on the scene probably couldn't um, diagnose it readily. They'd have to send tests away, so I, I don't know. There's no point asking me this. Um, so what we have to do is look at the videos where the, uh, the common features were there, the dry cough, the fever, the, the, the malaise and, and the fatigue. And we did notice that in the information we've got so far, the chorizal symptoms, the, the runny nose and the cold type features in the novel coronavirus 2019 tend to occur late. But the only advice I can give is that um, if you think you've got it, the advice in my country, and I, it would make sense everywhere, is that people should stay at home, self-isolate as much as possible. In my country, you ring a number called 111, which will get you through to a health advisor. So stay at home and ring up your local uh, health authorities is the only possible answer to, to that question and be guided by them. If they are sufficiently concerned, they can, uh, initiate, uh, they can initiate testing. Uh, another another question I get asked quite often, and it's not clear the answer to this, is how many people who get the virus get a severe disease? Now, it seems that quite a few people are getting mild disease who, who catch the virus. And this is very encouraging that a lot of people just seem to have a mild illness or a short-lived 
illness. We still need to follow these people up because of the lag effects of possible longer term complications, of course. But it does seem that many people, I'm picking my words carefully here, it does seem that many people uh, get a mild course. And maybe 15 to 20% get more severe disease. And the paper I'm going to look at, I think we'll probably make it the next video now, but the paper I'm going to look at looks at that in, in great detail from the Journal of the American uh, Medical Association that we're going to look at in the next video. Um, so um, s stay at home is basically the, the, the answer and get, and get local help and get tested. Now, before we look at today's figures, um, I did look down the 28 affected countries uh, so far and uh, I noted there was no African countries on that list from the Johns Hopkins site, which of course is excellent as long as there are no cases in those countries. But if you go to a lot of African countries now, there's some excellent Chinese infrastructure. And that obviously means that uh, Chinese engineers and workers are going back and forward to African countries. But many health service areas in African countries do not have access to the, uh, the quite sophisticated testing kits I mean, in, in my country, uh, I'm pretty sure today, all the testing is still done centrally. Now, if your local doctor in the UK is worried about you, he can send off a sample and get the results back from a centralised laboratory uh, in, in the same working day. So, so it's not a problem particularly. I mean, to get it quicker would be nice. And mobile tests are being developed. Um, but in some African countries, the, the testing is just simply not available. So that means people may have it and not know about it and uh, may be spreading it. Now, I don't want to be alarmist. I do hope not. But in these videos, I've always said that the most likely modality of widespread uh, cross infection is probably going to be the virus becoming established, forming a new cluster in areas where uh, health facilities are less available and people do not have access to um, good healthcare facilities. So that is somewhat of a concern. Um, I've been following this for some time now, if you've been watching these videos, and uh, the reason I started doing it was right at the start, I thought, well, this has got the potential to become a pandemic. Um, and uh, th th that's, still, that's still my view. I, I do think this is probably going to spread. I do hope not. But uh, it probably is, is going to. So we need to be ready for this as much as possible. Um, let's hope I'm wrong. I've, I've been wrong plenty of times before. Just a quick look at today's figures. So uh, sa um, I've, I haven't changed the date. Silly me. So it's, it's Sunday, the, uh, Sunday the 9th. Sunday the 9th of February. Um, the latest figures I've got here are... 37,583 confirmed cases, 814 confirmed deaths. This is a bit of a milestone, actually. It means there's now more confirmed deaths than there were in the, uh, in the outbreak of severe acute uh, respiratory syndrome, the SARS, in 2002-2003. But 8, 000, uh, 2,860 recovered cases still in, in 20 countries. So that's the current state of affairs. So I'm going to leave that there. Um, if a video comes down, do, do, do be patient. I will put it back up as, as soon as I can. Um, and, we're, and the next video, we're going to look at this paper from JAMA uh, in a lot more detail.